Hello and welcome to the talk. I was sent. I know where your house lives. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few details. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few details. As you all know, there is the C3 News Show. And if there is something interesting you want to share, you can do so at c3news.show. And as far as we think it is relevant, we're going to include it into the show. Then, um, this talk will be held in German. So, if you want to, uh, if you want to, if you don't speak German and you want to understand it, uh, there is going to be a translation. You will find it in your favorite player somewhere to change the, the, the language track. Um, if you have questions, so um, you can post them via Twitter or Mastodon using the hashtag R3S or going to IRC, which is like Discord but for boomers, and you can join the channel R3S. And enter your question there. Our signal angels will happily take your questions and magically beam them down to our devices. Without further ado, this is a pre-recorded talk. The speaker is here in person and you can ask questions. Ist er hier persönlich da und ihr, wir können die Fragen stellen. Somit, Mats ab. Welcome to my talk. OSINT, I know where your house lives. What is OSINT? OSINT is short for Open Source Intelligence. And it does not have anything to do with open source software, as a lot of you might know. It's about gathering information, gathering intelligence through public sources, which is the open source. This term originates in US intelligence agencies. Und es geht dabei um das Zusammentragen and it's used to gather information and create the whole picture. You can also call it to gather the footprints of someone or something. Why do you want to use OSINT? It can be used to verify information with the principle of trust no one. And this is very important for journalists. The other idea is to gain more information, which is important for journalists, intelligence agencies, police apparatus, or journalists, or just people who are interested in a certain topic. You can use it perfectly well to stalk people on the internet, which can be useful, but it is more useful to know what your enemy is going to do and how to protect yourself from being stalked or how to restrict that. Of course, you will develop a very strong Google Foo. There's also OSINT, which is OPSEC, which is a uh, opposites. I have an example here where somebody wrote that they had to delete their tweet after somebody sent them a photo of their house. I'm not sure if it's a parody, but the threat is very real. And usually you do not want to have those kind of information sent to you. You don't want anybody to find out where you live. OPSEC I talked about, what is that? This is another American term, which means operational security, which are measures to restrict the information gathering of the enemy. It is a term originating in war times. And on the right hand side you see 
a poster from a campaign from the Second World War. Germany had similar campaigns, and this is a term that is being used today on the Internet for data security, privacy, and the idea is that you put out as little information as necessary in order to make it harder for your opponents. Ja, da ist der Vortrag vom 35C3 OPSEC für Datenreisende sehr empfehlenswert, wenn ihr den noch nicht gesehen habt. Maybe you recall this Schaut picture, an. which was tweeted by Donald Trump in 2019. An dieses Foto, das hat this is an example of an OPSEC fail, which shows an explosion or the result of an explosion at a rocket launch in Iran. This is a top-down photo of a rocket launch pad, which was discussed in, a, in talks with intelligence agencies from the US and the US president. So this was tweeted by the US president, but it was unclear who it was taken by or who it originated from. This photo is unusually sharp and clear and has high resolution, has very low distortion, as satellite photos usually do. So it was suspected that this could have been taken by a drone. People obviously wanted to find out where this photo originated from, whether it was taken by a drone or maybe a satellite. So a lot of people took a look at this photo. Oder noch irgendwas. Und haben and sich from the light mirroring effect in the middle of the photo, you can tell that this was a printed photograph and not a digital photograph that was uploaded by Donald Trump. This was uh, clear which rocket launch pad this was, and the date of the rocket launch was clear as well but the time of day was not available, was not reported. It was clear that the Americans had spy satellites in the orbit over Iran, but it was unclear which orbit they specifically had and which drone or which satellite was when at what time, because obviously they don't publish their drone flight plans. You can see that there are several shadows on this photo, which you can use to determine the time of day. There are obviously online tools for this. In this case, it's suncalc.org, where you can enter the location on the world, enter date and time, and it will calculate where the sun is and where the shadow would be at that time and at that position. If you reconstruct the shadow as seen in the photo, you can find out when that photo was taken. This launch pad is a circle, as you can see on this satellite photo, but because this was taken from the side, it is squished. If you reconstruct the actual circle by um, emulating the squishing, you can find out more about that. Top right, you'll see the original photo, and bottom right, you'll see a satellite photo that this person has squished the exact same way. So he could use that to calculate the exact angle this photo was taken at. So the time of day and the angle are an exact match for position of a keyhole satellite, USA-224. Keyhole satellites are espionage satellites by the American government. Now the question is, how do we know what these, where these satellites are if the orbits are not public? Well, there's a satellite spotting community which observes satellites at different times of day, and they can reconstruct that orbit or calculate that orbit from their observations. They can do that relatively accurately. Therefore, this was confirmed to have been taken by this satellite, and 
After that, we had more information about the resolution and photo quality of this satellite that we weren't aware of before. It was not clear how high uh, how high quality the images this satellite is able to take would be. So this is assuming we know the location. If we do not, we can utilize geolocation where a photo or a video was taken can be determined by collecting different details, everything that you can see or other information you can gather different ways from that photograph. You can use that to do further research and at the end you should obviously verify your results. While collecting details you can collect metadata for example, EXIF data or other metadata that might contain location data, that might be GPS data, for example, but in most cases you're not going to get that. However, you can take a look at the color profile. Usually that is not going to be removed from a photo that is uploaded to Twitter or other social media platforms. The EXIF metadata is commonly removed, but color profiles will stay in that photo. Apple devices, for example, have a unique color profile, therefore that might be used to uh, gain the information that a photo was taken by an Apple device, probably an iPhone. You can also use server-side metadata, which might be a header like the last modified header. Or you can take a look at who a photo was taken by, if you're aware of that. And you might know where a photo was taken by a certain person and where that person was at a certain time by extension. You might also have further information from that person where he or she might be regularly or has been before, where, what kind of interest they have and where they might go. So those are not directly information that you can gather from the image itself, but are very relevant. You also have non-obvious visual information that you can collect. That might be the direction a photo was taken from. Or which direction shadows are going or even the environment, the season, do you have the sea or mountains in the background, or in the forest. You can see if there are any stores in the immediate environment, if you get a name, that is obviously great, if you can use that to search for that specific store, or if you can see that it is a shoe store, might help. You can also take a look at the vehicles, which kinds of vehicles are those, how old are they, which condition are they in. You can use that to estimate which country it is in. That might also include observing people, what kind of people are running around there, which clothes are they wearing, what might that be a cultural match for, which environment could it be roughly. And the same goes for buildings. You can take a look at the architectural style, you can note down how many floors a building has, how tall it is, which condition the buildings are in, or take a look at the traffic. Are cars driving on the left or the right side of the road? Can you see road signs, road markings, license plates? Even if you might not be able to immediately tell what or from where something is, you might still want to note that down. There are a lot of other clues that you can gain from observing a photo very closely. They might not be, they might not seem obviously relevant, but they can be very important.
If you want to do your research, you can always just put it into Google. It sounds simple, but it's not a bad idea at all. Maybe somebody else has described that photo or has talked about it. You can put the contents into Google. If you can see a shop or a street name, anything in form of text, you can put it into Google. If you have a rough idea where it might be, you can put that into that search as well. What is very useful is also reverse image search, where you can upload the photo itself and the search engine will compare that to similar or the same photo and that might help you as well. There are also a lot of different lists and databases, for example, uh, Wikipedia sites, traffic sign comparison websites. There are databases and photo databases for a lot of things that people might be interested in. Photo databases or photo websites are going to be discussed further in later. A lot of you might know Google Images for reverse image search, but that is not the only thing. There is Google Lens, which is slightly different. There is also Yandex uh, reverse search, which is a Russian search engine. There is Bing, there is TinyEye, Karma DK, and stock photo websites. And there are also search engines for logos or different trademarks. Depending on your case, different search engines might be useful. Maybe you can find the same picture on a different site. Or maybe you're going to be able to find the original. Yandex and Google Lens are usually able to identify buildings or different objects are according to the style. Google Images rarely does that. Google Images is really more suited to finding the same photo, not different photos that show the same thing. Karma DK is used for searching Reddit, which might be interesting if a photo went viral on the internet, for example. And you might be able to find different Reddit posts for it that way, or different information that you can gather from those posts. This is an example. In order to do a reverse search with this, a lot of people probably already know where it is, but not everybody might. So Google Builder, uh, Google Google Image Search is not very helpful here. If you scroll down, you find optically similar pictures, which are relatively similar. Buildings in a similar style, but none of these photos shows the same building. The Bing reverse search works much better here. It immediately recognized that this is the Congress Center in Hamburg, Germany. And it gives you the text Hamburg above the entrance of the building. Yandex also immediately recognizes that this is the Congress Center, Hamburg. So these image searches, search engines are very different from one another. It really depends on your specific image and your specific case, which search engine is going to be the most useful. In general, what would be useful is to crop a photo to exactly what you're looking for. So if you're only interested in a part of an image, you might want to just upload that part. You can also edit images to 
also squish <laughs> or de, um, or make it easier to see or clear what you're looking for. Maybe somebody else has uploaded something that shows the same object. Cropping is very useful. With Yandex, you can do that in the web search. In this case, you get a yellow outline where you can select what you're looking for. I use this to crop it down to the fairy dust rocket, which was not recognized previously because it's such a small detail in the big photo. With this crop, the, the results are much better. This tower is the similar result. Or in this case with the CCC, the modified CCH logo. CCC logo, also the modified CCH logo. This really gives you information about the, the CCC Kiosk Communication Congress in CCH. This could have the slogan, nothing is true, everything is allowed, or fake it till you make it. You can pull, pull up and fo put photos in your image editing uh, programs of your choice. In this case, I have turned the CCH into a CCC, which is useful, especially if you know that one information is not available in that photo the way you have it. If you are, for example, looking for a building, but there is a large tree in the way. You can edit that in an image editing program. It doesn't have to be very fancy, as long as it's enough to uh, edit it enough to give the reverse search engine enough information to look for something that looks very similar and that has that detail you're looking for. In this case, I uploaded that modified CCH logo and it worked very well with Yandex. So I got information about the Chaos Communication Congress in Hamburg. Reverse image searches also have lists and databases. There are databases and lists for practically everything. That might be flora and fauna and how common they are around the world. You might take a look at different plants in the image. When and where do they grow? Databases for buildings. Or for traffic. That might be boats, trains, satellites. You can search for flags or traffic signs, license plates. There are also street art databases where they categorize or list different street art and how you can search for it. Historical weather data. There are also databases which contain almost all Wi-Fi networks that are out there or lists of leaked passwords and email addresses. There are a lot of those. If you're into OSINT, you have to be creative and just throw some information at some of these resources and see what comes out. A very big database is OpenStreetMap, which is practically the whole world in one geodatabase. You get very detailed results, especially in the more metropolitan areas. It's very useful because you can search for specific objects according to their details, to their properties. For example, what kind of type of streets you see, how many lanes you have, traffic lights, what kind of traffic rules apply, letterboxes, a catalog, bus stops, advertising, 
Zigarettenautomaten und andere Sachen sind in OpenStreetMap drin. The larger the community in a specific area, the more data you're going to find there. Sind auch diese Sachen. Let's go to a practical example. Somebody posted a photo and asked where this was taken. If you take a look at that photo and note down what you can see, then you have a lot of details. I highlighted a few. The photo has a lot of information. There is some greenery behind. Noch so ein Stück Grünfläche ist. You can see a traffic light. Man sieht in der Mitte eine Kreuzung mit einer Ampel und man sieht eine Verkehrsinsel für Fußgänger bei dieser Ampel. And you can see street signs. Not sure if it's clear here. On the right sign you have right of way. Ich weiß nicht, ob man das jetzt sehen kann. Rechts. On the left you have a prescribed direction. Und links ist ein Verkehrszeichen. Or you can only go straight or right. Da darf man nur gerade ausfahren oder rechts abbiegen. And you know from the author of the tweet that this is taken in Hamburg, Wandsbek. You can use OpenStreetMap data for this. Where are you going to find these traffic rules and how they are, how these restrictions are noted down in the database? You have the, you have the no left turn, only straight and right. And then you can use that to search for this street sign in Wandsbek. This tool is called Overpass Turbo. And you can use very detailed queries. It can take practical uh, common language search terms. On the left side, you see the generated query. On the right side, you see a map of results. These are all crossings in Hamburg once big. We're not allowed to take a left. It's a relatively small list. You can zoom in and see if anything roughly matches what you see on the photo. And then check out Google Street View or something similar. If you had bigger amounts of data, you might want to add further restrictions to your search, like how many lanes you have, other different traffic rules, right of way. There are all different restrictions you can search for on OpenStreetMap. In this case, it didn't take very long till I found that. This is a photo taken by Mapillary, and I marked this piece of art, this poem, in green, on the back side of a parking machine. Another example, somebody asked, where did I take this photo? which has a lot of information in a C3 different details. On the right side you see the number 39, house number, you can see three license plates from Berlin and Brandenburg, and in the middle you see something a pretty unique piece of a building where two buildings are connected by a series of bridges. So I checked in OpenStreetMap and found out that this kind of bridge structure has a separate object type in OpenStreetMap. There are over 2,000 of these kind of buildings. So it wouldn't be very useful to look at every one of those. However, you can look for you can look for building equals bridge, and then look for the house number 39 in the area. So you find exactly one of them in Berlin. You see this query, which is very simple, or very short, rather. Not necessarily simple if you're not aware of the syntax. It's a very powerful tool if you know how to use it. 
So in a very short time, here you were able to find this structure. So you see it's in Lünerstraße 39 in Berlin. Now you, we're going to talk about image databases. You have Google Street View, which a lot of people might know. But there's also Mapillary or OpenStreetCam, which work very similarly. However, the last two are mostly or exclusively filled by volunteers. Especially in Germany, there is very little Google Street View imagery. But Mapillary is much better in that regard. In many cases, you're going to find more accurate or more up-to-date photos. There's also Google Places, which is a company site that you might find through Google Maps. There's also Foursquare, Yelp, and TripAdvisor, similar. All websites where the users or the owners might upload photos. Often you're going to find content by the owners. In some cases you're going to see environmental details. And that might help you to find the information you're looking for. You can also try travel websites. You, for example, see a hotel in the area or travel photos that people have taken in front of the hotel or maybe real estate portals, couch surfing portals. In many cases, you're going to see photos of flats or the environment. You can try to find photo websites or something like Flickr and search for the area, for the place. You might also check out Wikimedia Commons, which are photos which are used on Wikipedia. It's very advantageous that they are usually sorted very well. In many cases, they also have geodata with them, or also find map mapping services which show these Wikimedia Commons photos on their maps. You might check out social media like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You could put in the place name that you're looking for. Or you can try to use the place locator. There's often a difference between the geodata, the location, or the place name. Snapchat also has a map, which you might actually be able to use without an account. Or you can view photos which have been uploaded previously. There are also webcam websites, which offer you different webcams to view which can be very helpful to find certain places. You can also use YouTube or similar video websites. Maybe somebody has uploaded a video in the area. Maybe somebody took a vlog somewhere or uploaded drone videos, drone footage or similar things. There are also map services which offer map data, or aerial photographs as well. OpenStreetMap has a lot of those. There's much more than simply OpenStreetMap.org's map data. You can also download those data sets and use those to search through the data. There are a lot of views that you can use on top of these data. There are public transport maps on top of OpenStreetMap. There are a lot of different ones. 
if you use the OpenStreetMap editor, either ID in the browser or JOSM. They both have a lot of map or aerial photograph photogra uh, photos which are intended to help edit OpenStreetMap, they might be very useful to combine this and to just choose these different services and view the imagery. You can also check out Google Maps. You might want to check out the satellite view or 3D search, 3D view or use Google Earth, which is similar. You might know that it offers you the ability to view an area in 3D. What is also highly recommended are geo portals from the different um, counties or countries. They usually have very highly detailed geodata about buildings and different structures. Often, you find details about buildings like size by the centimeter, which kind of use that building has. You find maps of environmental data, a lot of things that you're not going to find on Google Maps. Often you can also find orthophotographs, which are filmed straight down, or aerial photographs, which are often taken at an angle. There are also websites like Sentinel Hub, Zoom.Earth, or similar to Google Earth, which offer exploring different satellite imagery. Often these satellite images are only available commercially, but in some cases you can use these tools to view them, or at least the free, the free versions of those. In some cases, you even get um, up to date, up to uh, daily current images. You can also do OSINT with social media and others. You can analyze the followers of a user, the metadata of their content. You might also want to do some research about a username, maybe check out leaked email or data, uh, password databases. You might also want to analyze the content that somebody uploaded. Follower analysis, you can say that the first followers often are real-life friends or family. In that case, that could be useful, because these websites usually show the followers in a chronological manner. So if you scroll all the way down, you're going to see the first followers. You can take a look at what kind of people those are, and maybe they have published information that have not been published by the person you're trying to investigate. Maybe you're going to find out what the interests are, what kind of sports they do. And if there are multiple of the first followers of a user have certain things in common, that might give you a hint that this could be details that might be accurate for the person you're trying to research. Maybe you're going to find photos that they have uploaded themselves or uploaded by different clubs, like sports clubs. And if you try to do metadata analysis, you can take a look at when they usually post, 
Zu welchen Uhrzeiten postet diese Person üblicherweise? How they post? Wann fängt die an? Wann hört die auch so Sachen zu posten? Do they use their the Android app, iOS app or the web browser? Wird das mit der Android app gemacht, mit der iOS app wird das im Browser gemacht? A lot of social media apps show this kind of information. I'm not quite sure why they do that. Oft anzeigen. Ich weiß nicht genau, warum die das machen, aber oft machen sie es. You can also uh, use that data to analyze when they use their phone and when they use the browser. Are there times when they post regularly or are there times when they usually don't post? Are there any changes in that? Are there irregularities? Und gibt es da Abweichungen oder Unregelmäßigkeiten? You, you might have information about when they sleep, when they're active. Wenn sie schlafen oder wann die beschäftigt sind. Vielleicht auch in welcher Zeitzone die leben, falls wir das gar nicht wissen. Und wenn jetzt so somebody always seems to have time in the morning and in the evening for 23 minutes for social media, that might give you a hint that they might be on a bus or on a train during that time. It doesn't have to be accurate, but it's a strong indicator. And you might be able to do more research that way. I'll highly recommend the Spiegel Mining talk by David Griesel from 33C3. If you haven't watched it, so. Do a username research. You can take a look at how many accounts have that same username. You might also be able to take a look at which usernames have been used by that account before. Maybe their reactions, the ad mentions under old posts on that account, which uses the old name. And gucken uns dann die Antworten an. Und dann stehen da in der Regel Mentions drunter, also Erwähnung von dem. In that case, they might not have been changed by the platform. Durch diese Social Media. Which might give you hints about old usernames used by that person. Und dadurch kommen wir dann an. I mean, that has been used by. By that person on old online games or something. Maybe the Steam name or an Xbox name there. You also have the option of using caches, Google Cache or different web archiving sites, scraping sites. Or you might find an old version of a social media profile. Und finde vielleicht eine alte Version davon und kann dann gucken, wie das Profil These scraping websites might pop up when you scroll through Google results, which might show old information about Instagram. They obviously want to earn money with that, but they can be very useful. Aber die sind dann ganz nützlich, weil sie teilweise eben diese alten Benutzernamen dann noch beinhalten und dann kann man die da raussuchen. You may also be able to find the unique ID for a certain account. When you might, which you might be able to use to search for that exact ID, which could help you as well. If you have a list, you might find a list of sites where that username has been registered. And then you can do more research on all the accounts that have used that same username on other platforms. Maybe they have a profile on a classifies website, which might give you a hint as to which city the person lives in. What is also very useful are emails and passwords. Almost every one of us has been included in a data leak before. And you might use that to find out which email addresses have been used with a certain username, which accounts might use the same email address, which would give you a hint, onto other usernames. Then you might take a look at the passwords that have been used and search through data leaks where that same password has been used. Accounts 
auf der gleichen Plattform oder auf anderen Plattformen As a downside dasselbe Passwort to verwenden. Das ist natürlich der Nachteil, who always use the same password everywhere. So my recommendation is to don't use the same password everywhere, change it and use different passwords for different sites. You might want to use the password reset functionality, which can sometimes leak email addresses or phone numbers. In many cases, these are partially censored, but you could still use that to do some guessing. Maybe you might be able to use Gravatar, which is a website which collects profile pictures from users which can upload it there. These profile pictures essentially are addressed by using an MD5 hash of the email address. You might want to put that MD5 sum into a search engine and therefore find websites where somebody used the exact same profile picture. That person's profile picture. Ein Gavatar Bild verwendet. Dann können wir uns aus der URL diese Hechtsumme kopieren und dann suchen wir einfach mal im Netz nach If you use that hash and search by that two different search engines. Wo dieselbe E-Mail Adresse benutzt wurde. Um ein, Password reset ja, um um ein um ein happened to a certain US president, US president, which caught him some ridicule, geworden, der used a random Gmail address to register his official social media profile as the president of the United States. Und wenn man bei Twitter And if you try to use the password reset, you're going to be able to find this information. This is possible to be disabled. In your Twitter settings, you can change this default from showing part of that email from that email address to having to know the full email address before being able to reset the password. In this case, it's not just a placeholder of having always three stars just as a placeholder for anything in between. They actually have one star for each letter or number. In many cases, you might not be able to find the phone number itself. But if you find a phone number somewhere else, you might be able to um, compare that to the uncensored parts of the phone number that you see through resetting the account. You might be able to find out who a person regularly interacts with, which topics and hashtags do they use, and which languages are being used, other recognizable spelling or grammar mistakes. An Austrian politician has received hate mail on their social media page. Behauptet, dass jemand anderes am Computer war. Allerdings hat dann in der Erklärung von diesem Accounts they made punctuation mistakes. Die dieselben Zeichensetzungsfehler gefunden. Essentially always using a space and then a comma. Gesetzt. And they found somebody else who was openly hostile before, and they matched those grammar mistakes from the anonymous account to that public account of a person through their grammar mistakes. If you have words which are only used in a certain region, you might be able to use that to get a rough location. Maybe you're going to find certain uh, yeah, certain descriptions, like I live in work, or different stuff about family, with different keywords. 
account completely. So you might want to focus on the things that will actually get you some results. After having collected all this information, you should try to verify your results. Results often can be based on while searching guesses. You might just follow some rabbit hole. And after collecting these results, you might want to verify that they're actually correct. You may have just found a similar result. It might be a different user with the identical name. Or you might have found a different house with the identical, an identical architectural style. So you might want to consider if you can actually prove that these data are the exact same. There is not exactly a guideline for this, but there are certain things that might give you a high confidence in your results at the end of a research. There are the option of checking dot keys on a GitHub or GitLab profile. Und das gibt einem alle SSH -Keys to see all keys, SSH keys uploaded by a certain user on one of these websites. This is also available for private instances of GitLab, for example. And in that case, you might have the option of using that public key to request a server, an SSH server, whether it knows that public key whether it is in there, whether it is accepted, which might uh, give you the ability to verify if a user has an SSH key on that specific server. PGP key servers are very good as well. You might want to put in an email address and just see which what the keys that are attached to that, what other email addresses they are attached to as well. Often you have the exact same keys for private and work addresses or otherwise. And Git repositories are also very good databases. Because commits usually contain clear name, an email address, and also the time zone of the user, which you can check by looking at the Git history. Scroll back a few years and take a look at old activity from the author. Often you have email addresses from university or an employer, often you're going to find a clear name or a nickname which has been discontinued or dead names of certain people. In many cases, uh, changing your profile data at GitHub or similar won't help because it's not going to change old you're not going to change history. And even if you try to change that and do a force push, any old forks or pull requests are still going to retain those information. There are also GitHub or GitLab, etc., archives, which are also going to retain that information even if you managed to get it purged from the current repository. And even if you uh, managed to get it from your own repos, it's not going to help. You might also want to take a look at host names. TLS certificates often contain all domains, which a certificate is valid for. Für die so ein Zertifikat gültig ist. Das kann man sich angucken und dann this can be used to get the information about other domains that the certificate has been issued for. This is public record. 
in order for the browsers to even have any option to check it. There's a search engine like CRT.H, which you can use to search for that, take a look at different certificates. DNSSEC might also be interesting because NSEC records will contain the name of the next record, in which case you might have the option to enumerate all these entries to uh, essentially build a whole zone file. This has been restricted with NSEC 3, but it has still different vulnerabilities for information disclosure. Uh, for Wi-Fi, wi war driving is still a thing. It is a technique where you walk around with a Wi-Fi capable device and collect all kinds of information about networks in the area. You can use that to find out which networks are where. You can use the database on the screen, which is often used for geolocation, improved geolocation on phones, like Mozilla's or Google's databases, which can be used if you don't have GPS in a certain area. And there are also public websites. We might be able to search for an SSID name. In which case, it's probably not a great idea to post the neighbor's funny Wi-Fi names on Twitter, because that can be used to find your pretty exact location where you live. It doesn't have to be unique. In so einer Liste von WLAN-Netzwerken hat man ja üblicherweise But Netzwerke. The combination of different Wi-Fi networks in an area is usually very unique. I know where your house lives. There's the title of my talk, so, which is just wohnt, scratching the surface of the whole tip of the topic. My recommendation is don't post everything on the internet. internet Silence means security, security, and don't Wenn post information that is not relevant. Lasst möglichst alle Don't Infos raus, die nicht relevant throw everything sind. out of the window. Postet irgendwie nicht aus dem Fenster raus, ähm, auch wenn das nur irgendwo im Hintergrund Don't ist. Alles, publicize things. They're not relevant for what you're trying to say. Everything you say can and will be used against you in court. Here's a list that I put together of different tools. Uh, for OSINT that you can use, and if you're interested, follow at quiz time on Twitter. Every day they publicize, a, they publish an OSINT challenge. It's very fun, and you can learn a lot. You will solve a battle by solving one of those puzzles. This was my talk. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, feel free to post them. Dann fragt mich gerne. So, ähm, ja, vielen Dank auf jeden Fall, dass du es äh, für deinen Talk natürlich und äh, vielen Dank, dass du es hergeschafft hast. Ähm, wie äh, ihr sicher merkt äh, zu Hause an den Geräten, ähm, ist es so, dass der, äh, dass der Speaker gerne anonym bleiben will und deswegen werden wir auch nicht seinen Namen erwähnen. Ähm, gut, dann ähm, wir haben schon ein paar Fragen. A few questions. Ähm, und ähm, fangen wir mal I quote. ganz oben an und arbeiten uns weiter nach unten. Ähm, How far can a private eye go with OSINT? Is information they gather that way admissible in court? Well, I'm not a court. If you call experts, which present this kind of information in court in a way that it's usable, understandable, I assume that this can be used in court. Further question, is it OSINT if I have to 
pay for it, like using an API? I would say yes. Maybe other people have different views in that regard. I don't want to fix a definition of OSINT here. But Shodan data, for example, is public data. Aber die Daten, die Shodan zum Beispiel sammelt, das sind ja auch nur... Shodan collects data that is publicly Daten, available. Sammelt die ja auch nur von dem, was sie öffentlich finden. Theoretically, you can also ähm, find it yourself. Ja, das, ähm, kann man mit yeah, Shodan mostly makes it available for machines. Ja, Shodan macht die ja Are there slides or the show notes for download? Folien, äh, okay, I will Shodan upload those later. Noch nicht, aber die Share information. Danke dafür. According to relating to databases, is somebody keeping an up-to-date list? Yes, there are lists. I'll go back to this link list. This contains a few collections which are being kept up-to-date. Well, you can find these different databases. You can take a look. And you're going to find a lot of information here. Do you know alternatives to... Okay, danke dir. Kennst du Alternativen zum Altego? How far can you go back in time? Assuming you have a event from 2003 or something, and you want to get information about that, how could you geographically um, restrict that? That depends on your database. Depends on what kind of information you want to look for there. You might be able to find something, you might not find as much as you would with up-to-date, with, with current events, but you might find historical weather data, satellite data. It really depends. You might be able to find something. Do you know free passive DNS databases? that have a similar quality to commercial versions like Farsight's? Yeah, I found one before. I'm not sure if it's still a thing. Feel free to contact me and I'll check whether that's still up to date. And else, just check these lists. You're going to find a lot. Are there ver options for this to do some research automated? There are options which are specialized into like social media research or other things. According to what you're, depends on what you're looking for, you can automate a lot. Check the link lists. Guckt in die Linklisten, da findet ihr mit Sicherheit was. A question to show notes and the slides. I think I can upload them in the pre-talks, so you should be able to get the link there. I'll be able to post that on social media later. I'm pretty sure that we're going to be able to upload that in pre-talks. What do you think about Black Arch's OSINT repo? I'm not aware of that. There's the option of, uh, to calculate the position of an image of where light is coming from in a photo. You read a paper about that before. Are there online or offline versions that are modern? I know there's been research about this topic, but I did not follow that further. So I can't tell you if there are any tools in that regard. If there are, they're probably in my link lists. Can I just send all the fake data to the internet to make it harder to find the real data? Yes, it's a very good idea to use this kind of distraction maneuvers. You might want to attach a fake real name to your Twitter account or put a fake place in there which is not the real place you're in. 
or do similar things. It's very effective because then people want to search somewhere where nothing is to be found. Obviously, no Q&A should go without this. Somebody said that uh, they want to note that there's the cell mapper. So as a herald, I should say, what's the question? But we're going to skip that part. We're, we're through with all the questions. Oh, say thank you for coming and wish you a good travel back home. Thank you, and a lot of thanks for the stage. Goodbye.